prior to the 20th century, the atom was the atom. There were different kinds of atoms. You could have this kind or that kind, but we didn't break them down into smaller things like protons, neutrons, and electrons like we do today. In 1897, J.J. Thompson came along, performed an experiment with a cathode ray tube. He didn't invent the cathode ray tube. He used the already invented cathode ray tube to discover the electron. Here's what the apparatus or the experiment looked like. Now, this is a bit of a simplification. Bear with me on it. Okay, it works pretty well here for us. We start off with an electrode over here that we call the cathode. Hence the name, the cathode ray tube. A cathode over here that is charged by a power supply. Now, this is a bit of a simplification because the power supply would generate um, a potential difference of several thousand volts, not 1.5 volts like a battery or 9 volts like a battery. What we'd actually use inside one of the old style television sets might be a transformer to step up the voltage to a higher value. But that's not really important for us. We have a big potential difference, however we get that. Okay, and that causes the cathode to become negatively charged. And that causes this mysterious beam of particles or of something to leave the cathode and go towards the anode, the other terminal of, the power of, this, uh, uh, of this apparatus. Now, there's a hole in the other terminal. There's a hole in the anode, which allows this mysterious beam of whatever it is to go right through. Lots of people prior to Thompson had seen this, whatever it is, cathode ray, we'll call it, cathode ray, cathode ray tube, this mysterious purple cathode ray but nobody really knew what it was. Some people suggested it was light, electromagnetic radiation. Some people suggested that it was particles. Some people suggested that it was even charged particles. But nobody had any concept that it was subatomic charged particles like we do now. Thompson wants to figure out what these things are, what these mysterious cathode rays are. So he introduces down here at this end of it a magnetic field. In this case, I have the magnetic field drawn into the board. He could have easily had it going out of the board as long as it was perpendicular to the motion of the cathode rays. That caused these cathode rays to be deflected. That caused them to change direction. Instead of the cathode rays going straight through, now the cathode rays go in a circle as long as they're in that magnetic field. That told Thompson something. It didn't tell him that we have electrons are negatively charged subatomic particles. We haven't got that far yet, but it did tell them that they were negatively charged particles because only negatively charged particles would be deflected that way in an external magnetic field. Remember the hand rule for deflection? Thumb, fingers, palm. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, if we didn't know about electrons, then how do we know which way electrons would be deflected in a magnetic field? Listen, we knew lots about charge by this time, right? Remember 1819, that was like 70 years almost before this, Orsted discovered that moving electric charges generate magnetic fields. And then 12 years later, Faraday and Henry discovered that magnetic fields can generate electric charges or moving charges, generate electric current. We knew lots about electricity. We just didn't know exactly where it came from. We didn't know that it came from electrons or subatomic particles. So we knew long time before this that if particles are being deflected in this direction by a magnetic field, then they must be negatively charged particles. Okay? We're getting them. We still haven't established that they're subatomic. We still haven't discovered the electron, but at least we know that they're negatively charged particles. Let's do a little analysis on this, on this section of the cathode ray tube that we sometimes call the main chamber. This, as I call it, main chamber um, is an analysis real similar to what we've done before back in our magnetism unit. We say because the charged particles go in a circle in a magnetic field, we'd say Fc equals Fm. Centripetal force equals magnetic force, where mv squared over r equals qvb. One of the v's cancels, which allows me to simplify this a little bit. We end up getting mv over r equals q times b. Now, 
Thompson looks at this and says, uh, uh, oh, I don't know what mass is. Like, I know that these are negatively charged particles, but what's the mass? I have no idea. No idea, he says. What's the speed of these particles? Uh, I don't know. What's the charge of these particles? Oh, that's a good one. I don't know what that is either. He does know what R is. He can tell where these hit the screen because the screen actually glows when they strike the screen. That's how your television image is formed on one of these older style TVs. It's painted with a coating, a phosphorescent coating that glows when the cathode ray strikes it. So he knew where they struck and therefore he could determine what the value of R was. He could also determine what the value of B was because he introduced the magnetic field. But he's got one equation, three unknowns here. It doesn't help him out very much. So he introduces another section of this cathode ray tube, also with a magnetic field, but also with a electric field. Electric field caused by parallel plates. The magnetic field would cause these cathode rays to experience a force downwards, a magnetic force on them downwards. And the electric force, or the electric field, I should say, would cause these negatively charged particles to experience a force upwards. Two opposing forces. Now, if the particles are going too fast, the magnetic force would actually be bigger than the electric force, and they'd be deflected downwards. We don't care about those particles. If the particles are going too slow, then the electric force upwards would be bigger, and they would be deflected upwards. We don't care about those ones either. If the particles were going at just the right speed, Goldilocks effect here, if they're going at just the right speed, then these two forces will be equal to each other. And if these two forces are equal to each other, then the charged particles will go undeflected. We call this the velocity selection chamber because this chamber effectively selects a certain velocity of particles to go through undeflected. That's a big deal, right? Because if the particles go straight through undeflected, they're the ones that enter the main chamber. The other ones, we don't care about those ones. We've selected certain ones to go into the main chamber. The other ones we don't care about. Let's finish the analysis here. We say Q times E for the electric force, QVB for the magnetic force. Cancel out the Qs. V ends up being equal to E over B. Look, Thompson found the speed, not of all the particles in here, but he's found the speed of all the ones that go straight through undeflected. Some of them are going faster. Some of them are going slower. But these are the ones that are going through undeflected straight into the main chamber. Once he has this speed, he can sub it into here, and he's got one more variable. He's tipped the, the balance here now, right? He had two givens, three unknowns. Now he's got three givens and two unknowns. Still can't solve for Q. Still can't solve for M. But it's better. Ryan, how old are you? 18? Okay, so someone comes to the door and says to Ryan, Ryan, how, how old are you? And Ryan's like, I'm not, I'm not telling you. That's pretty creepy that you're even asking how old I am. And then the person says, well, okay, Mr. Tiki, how old are you? And, and I say, I'm not telling you. It's kind of creepy. You're asking me how old I am. Um, I'm not telling you. But then the person says, like, can you tell me something? And Ryan's like, I feel sorry for him. So um, I'll give him the ratio of Mr. Dickey's age to, to my age. Okay. So he tells the guy, Mr. Dickey is twice as old as I am. The ratio of Mr. Dickey's age to my age is two to one. The guy walks away. He's a little, a little frustrated because he wanted to know how old Ryan was and how old I was. He doesn't know that. But he knows more than he knew before, right? He knows that I'm twice as old as Ryan. So that's more than we had before. Thompson can't find Q and he can't find M. But he can't find the ratio of Q to M. Just like that guy walked away knowing the ratio of my age to Ryan's age, which is not as good as knowing Q over Q and M, but it's better than not knowing anything. It's more than we knew when we started. So Thompson rearranges this to solve for Q over M. Take the M down by dividing and the B down by dividing, right? M goes down to the right side by dividing. 
the D goes down to the other side by dividing. And we get Q over M is equal to V over BR. Remember, Thompson knows, he knows what V is now because that's the speed that came from the velocity selection chamber. He knows what B is. He knows what R is. Solves for Q over M by seven of those numbers in. And when he does, he gets this number, 1.76 times 10 to the 11. What do you think the units would be for this? Charge to mass ratio. Good. Q ohms per kilogram. You don't need to memorize this number, but it is a really, really important number. The reason is because that number is really big. In fact, it is bigger than the charge to mass ratio of anything else ever measured. Other people had measured charge to mass ratio of certain ions but nothing was anywhere close to as big as this one. Why is that a big deal? Well, if Q over M is bigger than any other Q over M ever measured, including the charge to mass ratio for any atom, then M must be smaller. So if we've got a bigger than ever measured charge to mass ratio, then we've got a smaller mass than we've ever measured before. In other words, we don't just have negatively charged particles, we've got, we've got electrons. We've got negatively charged particles that are smaller than atoms. We've got subatomic negatively charged particles. Does that make sense? These are inversely related, right? Q over M is inversely related to whatever that value is, 1.76 times 10 to the 11. And if that number is so big, then that number is going to be so small. If this is bigger than anything else ever measured, this is going to be smaller than anything else ever measured. So it's got to be subatomic particle. Now, I'm going to show you one more little thing here that I don't know if anybody would have started questioning this in their minds already or not, but I'm going to show it to you just on the off chance that somebody has. We've got the velocity selection chamber where the charged particles go undeflected. That is, some of them go undeflected. The ones we care about go undeflected. And then we've got the main chamber where the charged particles experience a magnetic field and therefore go in a circle. But something's happening back here too. Something's back, happening back here. These cathode rays, or as we now know them to be electrons, are accelerating when they go from the cathode to the anode. Sometimes we call this the acceleration chamber because they're accelerating. How do you analyze a charged particle that's accelerating, speeding up? No. It, well, it, it could generate EMR. Sure it could. Sure it could. It could generate EMR down here too when it strikes the screen. In fact, in certain cases, if they're high enough energy, they actually generate X-rays when they hit this. Now, not off of your TV. They're not high enough energy to generate x-rays, but they can potentially generate x-rays there. Talking about not so much what happens here, but the analysis of it. The analysis of when charged particles accelerate, that's like a car going down a hill, right? And when a car goes down a hill, we analyze it using conservation of energy, EI equals EF. The energy at the top of the hill would be potential, but in this case, it's electric potential equals kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill. We could solve for V there, the final speed. But why didn't Thompson just do that? Like, If Thompson wanted the speed for the main chamber, why didn't he just get it over here? Like, Why did he bother introducing this velocity selection chamber? He had to have the acceleration. Why didn't he just use the speed that he got from there? He doesn't know the mass of the charge, right? Look, if he knew the mass and the charge to plug into here, he wouldn't even need to bother doing this, right? It would defeat the whole purpose. If it had a mass and a charge and it was smaller than the atoms, then he would know that it was a subatomic particle. He wouldn't have needed to do this. So this is an analysis that we every once in a while see, but we see it now knowing that these are electrons with a charge of 1.6 and a mass of 9.11. So to do this, to do this acceleration chamber, we have to know what the charge and mass are 
Thompson didn't know when he did his experiment what the charge and mass were. All right. All right. So we've discovered the uh, the electron. Thompson already knew that atoms existed, right? So the electrons have got to be inside atoms. What does it look like? We got sometimes called the plum pudding model, sometimes called the raisin bun model, chocolate chip cookie dough model, the atom, whatever you want to call it. The atom consists of a sea of positive charge. That would be like the cookie dough. It's not like individual protons. We didn't have any concept of protons at this point. Just a sea of positive charge. Floating around in that sea of positive charge are my electrons. Like this is not even close to the model of the atom that we currently accept. Right? We say that electrons orbit around the nucleus now. And the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. We didn't even have any concept of a nucleus here. What about protons and neutrons? Just a bunch of electrons floating around in a sea of positive charge. It's way off of what we currently accept, but it's still revolutionary because it still implies the existence of subatomic particles, things that are smaller than the atom. All right, let's take a look at example number one that's on your handout that I gave you a few minutes ago. It says, electrons are accelerated from rest to a potential difference of 2,300 volts in a cathode ray tube. Determine the maximum speed of the electrons. When you have a cathode ray tube problem, you have to not only identify that it's a cathode ray tube problem, but you have to identify what part of the cathode ray tube it is. What part of the cathode ray tube is this? when we're accelerating electrons from rest through a potential difference. Acceleration chamber, velocity selection chamber, main chamber. It's the acceleration chamber, right? And in the acceleration chamber, we know that we say EI equals EF. And we know that EI is potential and EF is kinetic. Now, make sure you get this straight, right? Big V, little v. First one is potential, second one is speed. There's a difference, right? Two different things. Now, Thompson wouldn't have known the charge, but remember what we said when we're talking about the acceleration chamber, Thompson couldn't have did that because he didn't know the charge. We're doing that, so we must know the charge and the mass. So let's sub those values in. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times the potential is 2.30 times 10 to the 3 equals one half of the mass times the speed squared. Okay, just math now. Let's make sure we sub it in correctly here. Let's say 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 times 2.3 times 10 to the 3. Times it by 2, divide it by 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. And then we're going to square root that. We get 2.84 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. So these electrons, as they leave the anode, they start at rest at the cathode, they leave the anode here at 10 to the 7 meters per second, and then they continue moving through if they're going the right speed to go through the velocity selection chamber, and then they strike the screen at that speed. All right. Let's take a look at a second one here now. It says a charged particle passes undeflected through perpendicular electric and magnetic fields of 6,007 times 10 to negative 3. What's the speed of the charged particle? Okay, this is a cathode ray tube problem, right? Or, or it's like the cathode ray tube. We can actually do this with something called a mass spectrometer, which uses ions instead of electrons, but the analysis is the same as the cathode ray tube. So it's either the cathode ray tube or it's like the cathode ray tube. Which section of the cathode ray tube or the mass spectrometer would this be? Undeflected, electric and magnetic field. 
undeflected electric and magnetic field. Which section? Blue, red, or green? It's red, right? That's the only place where they go undeflected, and we have an electric and a magnetic field. So in that velocity selection chamber, we're going to say Fe equals Fm. The upward electric force equals the downward magnetic force. Q times E is equal to QVB. Qs cancel. V ends up being equal to electric field over magnetic field. We know what E is. We know what B is. E is 6,000. And B is 7 times 10 to the negative 3. Gives me 8.57 times 10 to the 5. Now, remember, it is conceivable that some electrons could be going faster than this. Some could be going slower. But they're not going undeflected. Okay? The ones we care about are the ones that are going undeflected. One more. And then that's all I want to do with you today. It says, determine the charge of the mass ratio of a particle that is deflected in an arc of radius 9.5 times 10 to the negative 2 meters in a cathode ray tube if the particle is moving this speed through this magnetic field. Which section of the cathode tube is this? Um, charge the mass ratio. Charged particle going through a magnetic field, going in a circle. Magnetic field, circle, charge the mass ratio. Which section? It's the green one. It's the main chamber, right? So we're going to say, as we always do in that main chamber, we're going to say Fc equals Fm because the charged particle goes in a circle. Well, whatever it is. Okay, we say it's a cathode ray tube, but I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe it is the mass spectrometer. Maybe it's a, another particle other than the electron. It doesn't really matter. The analysis is the same. Uh, MV squared over R is equal to QVB. One of the Vs cancel. MV over R equals Q times B. Take the M down by dividing, the B down by dividing. I get Q over M is equal to V over B times R. V is 3.6 times 10 to the 6. B is 0 0.710. And R is uh, 9.5 times 10 to the minus 2. Let's figure out what that is. Use some brackets on the bottom, 0 0.71 times uh, 9.5 times 10 to the minus 2. Five point three four times 10 to the 7. You guys remember the charge and mass ratio of the electron, of the initial cathode ray? Something times 10 to the 11, wasn't it? 1.76 times 10 to the 11. What do you got here? Is this an electron? No. Is it bigger or smaller than an electron? It's bigger. The charge to mass ratio is smaller. The mass is going to be bigger. Of course it is. You can't get a smaller particle than an electron. It's got to be bigger. We see that with a smaller charge to mass ratio.